Asalaamu Alaikum everyone. Um, thank you for joining. I'm just going to wait till everyone comes on. I see people trickling in. Uh, we have a great session of panelists today. Um, looking forward to hearing everything they're seeing. Everything they're saying. Um, we'll start in a bit. Great, let's get started. Um, salam again, everyone. Um, welcome to our webinar. My name is Atif Adam. I'm the treasurer at AMP, that's the Dominican Muslim Health Professional not for profit um, I'm a mental health scientist by training. I am dual faculty at the Jocelyn Center at Harvard and the Department of Mental Health at Hopkins. Uh, my background is in system science and structural disparities around chronic diseases. Um, I've been with AMP for a year and a half. At AMP, we bring together and strengthen the impact of Muslim health professionals to improve health and wellness. Um, this talk today uh, is brought to you by the Nas um, National Muslim Task Force, uh, structured around COVID-19. And we invite you to hear from an ex uh, exceptional panel of religious leaders and public health professionals on health and COVID-19 vaccines while fasting. Uh, the National Muslim Task Force was set up in 2020 around COVID-19. And it's a multidisciplinary group of subject experts ranging from health professionals, health policy makers, um, faith and religious leaders, social services and mental health professional committees working together to provide comprehensive guidelines to the specific needs and issues impacting American Muslims over the pandemic. Just recently, the group released their statement and infographic on Ramadan and, um, and the statement on, on how best to practice the prayers and fasting during, during Ramadan. Uh, today on our panel, we are featuring Dr. Hatim al Hajj, Imam uh, Talib Sharif, Dr. Sarah Madad, and Jaime Mujahid, Mujahid Fletcher. Uh, the, the way we've set up this panel is we'll have each speaker speak, speak about seven to 10 minutes. Um, We'll hold questions to the end, so feel free to drop your questions in chat. I'll bring them up towards the end. Um, yep, yeah, um, let me get started. Um, introducing our first speaker, Dr. Hatim al Hajj. Um, Dr. Hatim al Hajj has a PhD in comparative fake from Al Jinnan University. He's also a pa practicing pediatrician and the Dean of College of Islamic Studies, studies at Miska University. He's also a member of the Amjia Permanent Fatwa Committee. Um, Dr. Hatim al Hajj will speak a bit today about. Um, the wild vaccine, um, the differences between them, um, taking the vaccine during COVID, um, ha what happens if you have flu-like symptoms and how do you deal with that around COVID and the concept of herd, herd, herd immunity. Uh, thank you, Dr. Al-Hajj, and, 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 the, uh, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Rafi. Um, and uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, I have a few points to address in seven to 10 minutes. Uh, but these few points are um, actually very complicated. And there's also some controversy involved in <clears throat> some of them. Uh, so I will try as much as I can to be uh, brief, but uh, also uh, get uh, the core points across to your audience. Uh, the question of vaccines and Ramadan um, first, the issue of vaccines and whether Muslims should be vaccinated or not. And uh, there is always controversy about vaccines. This is not an Islamic issue. This is a, uh, a universal issue. There are people who have hesitations or reservations about vaccines or against vaccines. Uh, however, it seems that the vast, the very, very vast majority of uh, experts and uh, public health professionals uh, support, uh, you know, uh, vac the, the concept of uh, vaccination in general and the vaccines that are um, uh, basically promoted uh, by the NIH and the FDA and, you know, the American Academy of Pediatrics, the American Academy of Family uh, Physicians and so on uh, for children and for the general public as well. Uh, the COVID vaccines are not unlike the rest of the vaccines. There are also controversies about the COVID vaccines. 
and the controversy the controversy about the COVID vaccines um, is uh, basically um, tri pronged. Uh, there is there is concern about the harm of the vaccine, and honestly speaking, that particular uh, concern should not be primarily <clears throat> the concern of the muftis, but it is the concern of the public health experts. Uh, they are the ones that are uh, to determine uh, the benefit risk ratio. Uh, and that is what the Prophet Sallallahu meant when he said, Antum a'lam bi umuri dunyakum, you know, the affairs of your dunya better. So this is like uh, organic chemistry. This is architecture, uh, chemical engineering, and also, um, you know, uh, medicine, particularly advanced medical concepts of this nature. So we should defer to the public health professionals, and it seems that the public health professionals, uh, or the very, very vast majority of the public health professionals, have deemed those vaccines uh, beneficial and have deemed the benefit risk. Uh, ratio to be uh, favorable. Uh, so that's the, that's the first issue. If they deem them deem the the, uh, the benefit risk ratio to be unfavorable, then we can invoke then the fiqh principle or the Islamic principle of la darar wa la dirar. There should be no harm or harming, or just there should be no harm or reciprocation of harm. Uh, the second point has to do with um uh, you know the the uh, in general the use of uh the use of uh unwholesome substances uh nudges, uh filthy uh or unwholesome substances uh in uh, vaccines uh and uh, honestly speaking uh, you know the, when we talk about the bacteria for instance that, that has to do with you know, people say that these vaccines use uh, pieces of bacteria and viruses and so on and so forth, but there is nothing in the Quran and the Sunnah, uh, unless we're talking about harm, but there is nothing in the Quran and Sunnah that talks about the uh, najasa of these uh, microbes. Um, but even if we talk about certain things that are najis, uh, you know, that have been deemed the najis, there are many things that we need to say here. Uh, one of them is the, the fiqhi concept of yasir ma'fi anhu and la abrata bin nadir and some fiqhi concepts that uh, need to be invoked here. Yasir ma'fi anhu means trivial things are exempt. Trivial things are exempt. And that is uh, basically uh, a, a, a major principle in fiqh and the fuqa always use this principle. So. Uh, we as Muslims should not be hyper-technical because the Kalof is something that we have been forbidden from. Uh, should not be too hyper-technical uh, or too mutakallif. Um, and trivial things are exempt. Uh, and if you go even a step further, and I'm trying to be very brief here because there are several uh, points that I need to touch on. If you go a step further and address the issue of what if they are in fact the Najis or what if they are in fact certain substances are in fact unwholesome or filthy. And there is two out of four mazahib that would, and, and uh, particularly the Hanafis and Shafi'is seem to be a little bit more flexible in this respect. And they would allow uh, for the, you know, the benefit of the Dawi or um, uh, basically uh, treatment. Uh, if there are no alternatives, uh, and if we know that the substance is is, is beneficial and there are no uh, alternatives, they would allow uh, even the use of filthy, you know, bona fide sort of unwholesome uh, substances. Um, so we have to keep this in mind. The final thing that we want to say is that the mRNA vaccines don't have, um, you know, they, they they were not basically harvested in fetal cells. Fetal cells are not being used uh, for in that particular technology, which is the technology of the messenger RNA. Uh, this may be used in AstraZeneca and Johnson & Johnson vaccines to some extent, but it is important for people to remember uh, that these cell lines uh, are cell lines of aborted fetuses from 
the 70s. No fetuses are being aborted. No one in their right mind, Muslim or non-Muslim, uh, uh, of, of any sort of you know, uh, conscience uh, would allow the abortion of uh, fetuses uh, to harvest the cells and to produce vaccines. Uh, that's uh, just inconceivable. Um, and this is not happening and will never happen. Uh, also, it is important to, to note that uh, these fetuses may have been very well aborted spontaneously or been aborted for like uh, some uh, halal indication. Um, and uh, and uh, like I said again, uh, if, the, if, if people, you know, just for the so-called the khuruj bin al or to avoid controversy, uh, there are some scholars uh, now I would re change this a little bit and say that in Hanafi and the Maliki Madhab, they have a little bit more restrictions when it comes to using uh, human parts. Uh, they have a little, little bit more restrictions, although I know of great Hanafi scholars that have allowed organ transplantation, and the same would apply uh, here as well. Uh, but uh, but there is there could be some a little bit of controversy here. My position and this is not only my personal position, but also the position of the very vast majority of contemporary Muslim scholars is that these vaccines, even the ones that use the fetal cell lines are permissible to use. Uh, however, some of the scholars may have made the disagree with this. And for the Muslim who is actual, who have options, who have choices, uh, and they want to be whatever, they want to be uh, like overly cautious and they want to avoid controversy, uh, they would choose the Pfizer or the Moderna uh, uh, over the other ones. But if that is what is available, then I urge them uh, to basically use them because they are permissible according to the vast majority of uh, Muslim scholars. Uh, even the AstraZeneca and the Johnson & Johnson vaccines. So that's the, the part about the vaccines. Uh, when it comes to Ramadan and uh, taking vaccines while fasting, also the very, very vast majority of Muslim scholars would not consider injections that are not nutritious, that are not meant for nutrition or hydration, uh, you know, not IV fluids, not glucose, not something of that nature. Uh, if, if it is not IV fluids meant for hydration, if it is not glucose or uh, parenteral nutrition meant for nutrition, then the very vast majority of Muslim scholars would not consider those, vaccine, those uh, injections uh, to invalidate one's fasting. And that is the very vast majority. And that is the position of the, the largest uh, Fiqh Academy, International Islamic Fiqh Academy. It's the largest Fiqh assembly uh, uh, in the Muslim world. Um, there, you know, uh, some other issues like uh, that uh, I was basically asked to talk about, but I think I ran out of time and I may uh, probably address them uh, in the question and answer session. Thank you so much, Dr. Al-Hajj. There's so many questions I want to follow up with, but I'll, I'll wait till the end. I'll give everyone, the speakers, uh, time to talk as well. Uh, Next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Sairam Madhud. Dr. Sairam Madhud is a nationally recognized public health leader and epidemiologist in infectious disease and special pathogens. He's also been featured in the Fortune 40 Under 40 as the list of most influential in healthcare. He's a senior director of the system-wide special pathogens program at the New York City Health and Hospital and also a principal investigator in the Institute of Disease and Disaster Management Health and Safety Lead in the Enhanced Investigators Unit of the NYC Team and Trace Corp. He's also the core faculty in the National Emerging Special Pathogen Training and Education Center and a fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School, Belfer Center of Sciences and International Affairs. Uh, Dr. Madhid, uh, if you could speak a bit more, just following up on the from Dr. Al Hajj on the idea of efficacy what that means and what does 95% versus 66% mean? Um, should we be concerned about the different types of variants when it comes to these vaccines? And more so on traveling. I know the fact that there's a lot with Ramadan, there's people go between uh, states, but also traveling overseas. 
uh, how does vaccination help them do that? And 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 what are the still what are the social prescriptions they need to still consider as they as as they travel after vaccination? Sure. So first, uh, Sam, welcome everybody, and thank you for having me on. Um, these are really, really important questions, especially uh, in today's society where more and more people are getting vaccinated, but we also have a mix of vaccinated among unvaccinated individuals. And so what does that look like in terms of our own uh, risk calculus and what are the activities that we can do safely? So first, you know, getting to your first topic about efficacy and efficacy and effectiveness are two different terms, right? Efficacy is something that we look at in clinical trials. And if you're looking at the top line number of 95% or 94% or 66%. These are all different um, efficacies for different um, FDA authorized COVID-19 vaccines that are looking at within the context of clinical trials that are controlled environments, the risk reduction um, of, of illness. Um, and so you're looking at it from that lens. But I think to make it very uh, simple and easy, we should not be looking at these numbers in a sense. It's not a number game, right? And I know I, one of the questions I get very, very often is, should I get the Pfizer versus a Moderna versus a Johnson & Johnson? Which one should I get first? And I'm sure everybody has heard of multiple times in the news, the best vaccine is the one that you can get first. Um, and that's regardless, obviously, of which one uh, you're, you're offered. And there's a couple of reasons for that. And so the first, the reason is, all of these three um, vaccines that we have are extraordinary. They are remarkable in the sense that they help protect you against not only the most severe um, outcome, which is severe disease, hospitalization, and death, real world data. And this is not just based on clinical trials, right? So we can look at clinical trials that were done on thousands of people uh, and showed some really, really great results. But now if you look at the fruit of our labor, if you're actually looking at real world data and you're following the millions of people that are getting vaccinated around the world, and you're seeing countries that are further along their vaccination, you're seeing the effectiveness of these vaccines play out in real life. So effectiveness is what's happening in real life. And it is comparable to what we saw in the clinical trials of just how effective, uh, how eff efficacious these um, COVID-19 vaccines are. So first, all of the COVID-19 vaccines are highly um, effective in preventing severe disease, illness, and hospitalization. Not only that, they also help prevent asymptomatic transmission. So the big million dollar question we were all having in the beginning is that these clinical trials were set up with certain endpoints that were looking at symptomatic disease, but we weren't sure if you could still transmit that disease, um, that virus, if you were infected to other people. Now we have real world data that shows that there is a significant reduction uh, in the overall transmission to other people by 80 to 90%. That's not to say it's 100%, nothing is 100%. And let me put that in context, right? So if you look at some of the best vaccines that we have, um, for example, measles, right? Measles is, um, is, a, is a vaccine that, that we have. The MMR, if you look at the measles one, it's about 97, 98% um, you know, um, effective. That's amazing. If you look at seasonal flu, uh, depending on any given year, it's about 40 to 60% effective. But even with that effectiveness, you're seeing that it helps prevent millions of hospitalizations um, you know, every year around the world. In fact, if you look at the CDC data, it's showing that the seasonal flu vaccine, um, you know, even though it's between 40 to 60 percent, you know, effective, it still prevented an estimated 7.5 million cases of the flu in the U.S. during the 2019-2020 flu season. So that goes to show you just a how remarkable these COVID-19 vaccines are, that they're even better than our seasonal flu vaccines, and that you're seeing the real world results, you know, playing out um, in front of you. So they uh, greatly reduce the risk, uh, uh, you know, of, of infection, um, as well as spreading it to others. And so these vaccines are not just obviously beneficial to yourself, but it's also beneficial to those around you in the community and ultimately helping to end this pandemic. Now, if I transition over to, um, you know, how, um, how long will these COVID-19 vaccines last in terms of their protection? You know, that's a question that many of us obviously have. And, you know, we are still following up on the data. But I think right now, if you're looking at the, uh, the studies that are, that are coming out, you're seeing, for example, with Pfizer and Moderna, up until the six month point, you're still seeing very high levels of neutralizing antibodies. And that's only up until the six month point. We know it's gonna be much longer than that, but right now data is just showing us, you know, for, from six months on and we're still tracking um, individuals. But certainly I do think knowing obviously how va uh, vaccines work, knowing how coronaviruses uh, tend to behave, we do uh, expect that uh, the protection will be long lasting. It could be years, it could be, you know, many, you know, many years. And, and I think once we have more data, we'll have, um, you know, better indication on just how long that that protection will last. But I think it's also important to understand that 
when we talk about getting a vaccine, which is a safe way to build your, your immunity, um, it's not just about antibodies that are being produced. We have a, an immune system in the human body that is so complex and is so remarkable that we have this um, amazing response that develops, you know, not just antibodies, but memory cells, B cells, T cells. And so when you are introduced uh, or when your body is introduced with this virus, it has a memory and is able to fight it off even in the long term. And we're seeing that with other viruses like MERS and, and SARS. And so we can compare it to what we're dealing with um, a bit today. So I think it's just important to, to, to know that we're going to have, um, you know, uh, hopefully a really great response in terms of protection um, moving forward. Now, how concerned should we be about the variants? That's obviously top of mind for everybody that's in infectious disease and public health response and healthcare delivery. Certainly the variants of concern are very concerning. That's why they're called variants of concern. There's multiple variants of concern circulating, um, you know, just here locally in the United States. If you're looking at the B117, the P1, and if you're looking at the New York variant, Variants are going to continue to happen because there's just widespread transmission of COVID-19. And I think the, the first thing is, as we look at our current authorized COVID-19 vaccines, all of them still provide really great protection against the most severe outcomes. And so regardless of the variant of concern that we're dealing with, all of the, um, you know, all of the vaccines still provide high levels of antibodies um, you know, if we're confronted with this particular variant in a, in a meaningful way, if you will. And as I mentioned earlier, you know, our body elicits a very broad immune response involving a broad range of um, antibodies and, and, and uh, you know, uh, memory cells. And so um, we just wanted to keep to remember that, but we should always have a plan B, right? And I think it's really important that we have a plan B, because what if we have a variant that's able to escape the vaccine-induced immunity that we have? That's certainly a real possibility. We're not seeing that right now, but as you know, uh, the uh, prevalence of, of uh, COVID-19 continues to spread around the world, not just locally here, we'll always be faced with that threat. And luckily, we have a plan B. And so these pharmaceutical companies are looking at the variants, are looking at developing a booster shot um, and seeing how we can not only develop booster shots, but maybe tweak the, the current recipe that we have in the COVID-19 vaccines. So that is happening. And should we get to that point and, and should we have data that show, okay, we need to start providing booster shots, shots, we have that in our back pocket. But at this moment, at this time, we certainly have really great vaccines that's helping us against even these variants. But we'll need to continue to keep a good eye and a pulse on it. Now, getting to your, your last question in terms of, you know, travel and, and um, you know, going overseas, I think first, um, if you're vaccinated, it is um, amazing, A, that you're vaccinated, and congratulations, and I really hope everybody is able to get vaccinated if, you know, you're eligible and it's offered to you. B, once you're vaccinated, it opens up many more doors. Um, and so if you look at the CDC guidance, you know, it depends on the context of your activity. So if you're among other vaccinated individuals, then it's like, you know, going back to pre-pandemic days, you are able to do many more activities that you were doing uh, without masks, without social distancing. It gets a little trickier when you are in a group setting with unvaccinated individuals. So if you are in a small setting with unvaccinated individuals that, um, you know, are low, are, are on kind of the lower risk stratification of having a severe outcome, you can still meet with those individuals without masks, you know, uh, without social distancing. But if you want to apply some of the risk reduction techniques that many of us talk about in terms of having the, you know, gathering outdoors, um, you know, if you want to keep your, your mask on and distancing or opening up um, windows for good ventilation, these are all really great strategies. If you're in a group setting, with many uh, individuals, right, from many different households, you want to continue to do that safe COVID-19 um, behavior because you want to look at it from the lens of not just yourself, but those around you that obviously are still not protected. Um, and even for me, for example, being fully vaccinated, even if I'm in a, in a, in a setting uh, where I know, you know, um, either there's, there's a lot of people, um, one of the things that I still want to keep my mask on is because of the variants, right? Even while the vaccines provide really great protection against, against the variants, the vaccine you know, you can still um, potentially uh, get infected and have um, a mild case. And I certainly don't want to, uh, you know, don't want to be in that position when community transmission is so high. I would feel much more comfortable when we have very low prevalence of disease and I'm vaccinated. And that's when I'd feel more comfortable taking off my mask and, 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 and you know, letting go of those safe COVID-19 um, behaviors. Um, and the last thing that I'll mention is if you're traveling and you're fully vaccinated, 
you can resume domestic, you know, and, 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 and international travel. Um, you don't have to, to get tested um, or self quarantine after travel, but you also want to look at the destination that you're going in. So if you're doing domestic travel, then you don't have to get tested or self quarantine afterwards. But if you're going to another country, you want to look at obviously what the, uh, the prevalence rate is of the virus circulating the community. I certainly, if I was in that position, I don't want to go to a country that has very high levels of infection right now. That's just, even if I'm vaccinated, that's just, you know, I think it's just good to invoke the precautionary principle. And if you are planning on traveling to another country and you're fully vaccinated, you want to obviously look at what their restrictions are because they may still require you to, to get tested. They may still require you to quarantine. So it's, it's, so it differs from, from country to country. Um, and, and so with that, I'm certainly happy to take uh, additional questions at the end. Thank you, Dr. Madhu. That was fantastic. Um, and we've heard from both speakers a lot of positive information on why we need to continue taking vaccines and um, the benefits of taking either or vaccine and, and, and to continue uh, practicing all the uh, safe precautions that we've been doing. But if anything that we've seen over the last year or so is um, the message across our community is very heterogeneous. Different people hear different things, people pick up different things. So it's not, as a public health scientist, health communication, I think has been something that all of us had to learn uh, off the cuff starting March last year and hasn't been successful in different areas. Um, and, and that's something I think our next two speakers I really want to kind of understand is, while we heard all this positivity from an Islamic perspective, from a clinical perspective, what, why do we see some of these uh, quote unquote disparities or, or structural differences? Have they always been around? And what can we do as a community and in Ramadan to kind of make sure that we're going down the right path? So. On that front, I would love to introduce Dr. Imam, Dr. Um, <laughs> Imam Talib uh, M. Sharif. Uh, Imam Sharif is a president and Imam of the Historic Nations Mosque, Rajid mm. Muhammad in Washington, DC. He's also a retired US Air Force member with over 30 years of service and has served as Imam in five US cities and seven military locations around the world. He's an MBA from the American Intercontinental University and the student of the late Imam W.D. Muhammad, um, the Muslim American spokesperson for humanity. Um, Imam Sharif, the, the question comes up, um, the differences that we see amongst Black Americans and how Black and Latinx communities have been hit hardest by the pandemic. What do you think contributes to this mistrust in information and um, an actual uptake of vaccines? And just overall, Ramadan, being a second Ramadan in COVID, uh, what would you recommend and what we've learned from our previous Ramadans for Iftar, Tarawis, et cetera? And, and what would you suggest as we go forward into this Ramadan to continue being safe and, and practice with ourselves and our community? Hey, thank, thanks, Atif. And then as alaikum also to the audience and to our, our distinguished panelists here. I uh, just want to say here in those presentations that preceded mine, uh, we, we wanted one of the concepts in the religion for sure uh, when it comes to a particular subject is to listen to the experts and the professionals. And in listening to the experts and the professionals, we know that in the religion it says, if you take a life, it's as though you've taken a, a life of all of humanity. And also if you save a life. So with the, with the information we just heard, uh, the benefit far outweighs the harm and a lot of lives are being saved. Uh, and that's in accordance with religion in terms of what the value of a life is. And of course, we are, we are seeing, as you mentioned, uh, there are disparities. And, and, and they do have some, some roots, uh, some validity uh, to some of those. But again, with all the data we're seeing right now, uh, that's one of the biggest differences in some of the things that we're seeing in the, in the history of America. And, 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 and right off the bat, it doesn't take a person to have to look very far to see that people that are considered minorities, people of color are not being treated equally uh, in the country. We're seeing stuff right now, right before us uh, in, in our eyes. Uh, not just African Americans, also the Hispanic community, Puerto Ricans. In fact, um, birth control uh, due to experiments dealing with uh, Puerto Rican uh, women, et cetera. Uh, uh, their, their health, uh, a lot of unethical things were taking place. Uh, for African Americans, uh, certainly uh, in the communities, there's always been uh, disparities uh, in how they were treated. Going back, some of the history in terms of Tuskegee Airmen, that's one of the things that are cited the most. Uh, of course, uh, uh, they, were, they were given syphilis. This took place in Alabama. 
uh, starting from the 1930s on up. And, uh, and they were promised that they were gonna be, uh, be given the treatment, uh, but they never were, they, they lied to them. They never were given the treatment. Uh, many of them died, many of them went blind, uh, many of them had uh, other uh, serious health uh, issues and concerns. Uh, so these are things that, again, are in the memory bank and the parameters and what some of the hesitation is. And then also uh, specific cases in various communities, uh, even here in our area, John Hopkins, for instance, uh, with one of the uh, case of Henry, Henrietta Lacks. Here we had a, a mother, a mother of five, she was 31 years old, uh, went in complaining uh, about uh, pains uh, in a vaginal area. And of course, John Hopkins at the time was one of the few hospitals that would take quote unquote poor uh, minorities. And of course she went in and uh, she ended up having uh, cancer, uh, her cancer cells, and they began to study, use her for study, uh, do research on her without her knowledge, without the family's knowledge, uh, no compensation. So she went in and, and she died. You know, she ended up, she ended up uh, dying uh, that, that same year. And there's a lot of cases uh, where those kind of things have taken place. So that's, that's what lends itself uh, to some of the hesitation. Uh, but again, you see those that were targeted uh, towards different groups. That's not the case here that we're seeing uh, with this, this particular vaccine here. Uh, the data, uh, it's, it's a lot of data out there. Uh, we just heard from some of the experts. And of course, uh, we've heard some of the hesitation about how uh, quick uh, this, this vaccine uh, have come to the table. Uh, but we have to also look at that even some of these other experts would say that, you know, it's, it's been a hundred years since we had what they call uh, the, 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 the 1918 uh, virus. And uh, of course, my eyes have been coming together like the bright mass we have in front of us now, uh, studying this thing over time. Uh, so it's not in a vacuum uh, because uh, a, a law has been evolving the scientific mind. Uh, to be able to look at these things and isolate certain things, uh, getting things down to the molecular level, et cetera. And because our doctors can, can attest to that. Uh, so it's a, it's a lot safer uh, for us to look at now. And the, and the biggest hesitation is not having good information. Uh, this is why the programs like this are so important to give people information, uh, you know. And of course, this Ramadan is going to be different than last year uh, because we, did, we didn't have any vaccine. We were actually, we were, during Ramadan, we were praying um, that Allah would send some vaccine. And here now we have, our, our prayers have been answered. And as our dear uh, sister, uh, Dr. Matt has said that, you know, all of them are good and it's best to take what's available, you know, because they're doing, they're doing their job, they're saving lives. And uh, so this Ramadan, of course, one of the things we're doing, most of the people uh, have been vaccinated. Uh, so it makes it easier. Uh, but we still, you're still, you know, we're gonna see more, more mosques with people in them this year than we did last year. Uh, because many are being vaccinated. Uh, but still, that doesn't mean that we're going to lower the guard. We still want to take the precautions because of these different strands uh, that they're speaking about right now. So you still want to wear your mask, observe the distancing. Uh, but it's a little safer, uh, again, if you've been vaccinated, uh, because again, uh, you won't have the same trouble. And the data is showing us now that if you were to get COVID and you weren't vaccinated, uh, it could probably take that life that's, that's at the value of all of humanity. I'll, I'll end with that. I have to unmute myself. Thank you so much, Imam Shaif. Um, and last but not least, uh, Amy Fletcher, uh, I love your background. Uh, I, it's the first time I've met you, but I would love to stay connected. <laughs> um, Amy Fletcher is an entrepreneur, a John Maxwell certified leadership coach, an international public health speaker, a multimedia, Philman Honors graduate uh, from the Austin Institute of Houston, the founder of the global leading non for profit Islam in Spanish. Um, he's obtained certifications in filmmaking and has been accepted into the Harvard University's Hive Global Leadership Network program in Boston. He's also a media analyst on Univision, Telemundo, CNN in Spanish, and many others. Um, just, just stemming off of, 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 from the conversation that we just heard, Hami. Specifically, in the Latinx population, what are some of the barriers that you've noticed, um, specifically around vaccines um, and and even COVID messaging? Um, what role has Islam and Spanish played in promoting vaccination in the Latinx community? And just on a larger scale, are there special needs or concerns in the Muslim community? For example, people living alone, the el elderly who have been specifically impacted because of COVID that we need to pay more attention during this Ramadan 
that we might have missed out in the previous Ramadan? Assalamu <clears throat> uh, alaikum, everyone. Uh, first of all, it's an honor to be here and really appreciate um, all of the statements by everyone who has spoken here. Um, really appreciate the organizers of this program. When it comes to the Latino community, uh, you know, towards the end of the year, 2020, uh, the data from the CDC was showing that there was a disproportionate impact that the pandemic was having uh, on certain communities, obviously African-American. And as far as Latinos, we saw that their hospita hospitalization rate uh, was four times uh, the rate of, of, of whites. In our community in Houston, Texas, um, the Islamic Spanish Centro Islamico is the only Latino-led Islamic center in America that is focused on, on, on this demographic that is you know, the fastest growing demographic um, in America in regards to population, but also uh, according to ISPU, the, the Institute for Social Policy and Understanding uh, research that Dalia Mujahid uh, carried out, they are embracing Islam, Latinos are embracing Islam 700% uh, in growth in the last decade. So we're finding that in the city of Houston, Texas, uh, on average per year, about a hundred people are embracing Islam uh, that we know of there at our center and then many others online. So when we look at the polling regarding Latinos um, showing a, a less favorable view or let's say a trust or less, uh, they're, they're, they're less likely to trust the vaccine it has a lot to do with the information that they're being provided. And Latinos are, are a unique uh, group in that the first comers to America from Latin American countries are usually people who have a language barrier. And um, we find that people coming here for a better opportunity are also at times uh, older in age and they have a language barrier. So when we look at the type of information that they're receiving about the vaccine, there is a huge gap and a lack of accurate information available to the community. And one of the main reasons is because as things are progressing on the English side, and if, if, there, if it's been challenging to keep up even for the CDC, to explain about the vaccine and its updates um, in English, imagine the sort of barrier that exists where Latinos communities are lacking the resources in Spanish because there, there are gonna be less people who speak the Spanish language that are um, specializing in certain areas that can translate that information at a rapid rate as is happening. So that, that's, that's one of the main concerns that when the Latino community does not acquire information uh, from reliable uh, sources, then what begins to happen is that they begin to go online and they are getting all of the misinformation that is surrounding the vaccine uh, through social media, through YouTube, through WhatsApp groups, even word of mouth. Anytime that someone uh, posts some video where uh, there was an adverse reaction and someone lost their life or such and such thing happened, um, that becomes a scare uh, for this community, especially if that's where they're getting their information. So there's a lot of myths circulating around the vaccine. Uh, whether you can trust uh, the long-term long -term effects, uh, people uh, don't know. Uh, and then they begin to question also, uh, which is a whole nother tier of concern. Uh, let's say the second generation Latinos, that do have the language and they don't have the language barrier, they're younger, uh, let's say they're uh, enrolled in, in, in the educational system, uh, let's say they understand a bit about America. There's also a sense of uh, disenfranchisement when it comes to the policies that have been um, carried out um, you know, by the federal government regarding immigration uh, laws and just uh, aspects of marginalization that really impact the Latino community when it comes to simple access to healthcare. So even if someone is young and they're enrolled in a university and they, um, you know, they're married in the United States, they have uh, legal status, 
uh, doesn't mean that their grandparents actually have legal status or that their grandparents actually understand the information that they have access to in English because they lack that information in Spanish. But one thing that both of those groups, first generation and second generation understand is that for, um, and, and it was highlighted in the previous administration uh, mostly, but throughout the years, as the Latino population grows in size, there is a pushback regarding that growth. And there have been um, a very, um, concerning, uh, you know, discussions even at the border of, um, there, there is a, a BBC uh, article uh, from an ICE, uh, you know, immigration, uh, basically whistleblower, where even the government had to go and investigate or open up an investigation regarding um, women crossing the border from Latin American countries uh, being sterilized so there was a, a, an investigation of six Mexican women specifically uh, who were uh, sterilized while they were detained in a, you know, immigrant uh, detention, immigration detention center. And um, this really makes the Latino community think that if there is a new technology in regards uh, to a vaccine and this technology is, um, totally different than the previous vaccines for the flu. And, and there's actual technology that is tapping into certain proteins and there, it, it, it has a way to tap into the immune system in a certain way. If it is technology, what else does that technology entail? Uh, who benefits from that technology? And if anyone were to be put at odds regarding any type of technology and the uh, type of um, uh, you know, long-term effects that it may have, you know, would Latinos really, um, you know, be in, in a position that if they don't take the vaccine, they may be better off. That is a concern. Um, and some, because of the waves of how the strands have been happening and because of that technology needing to be updated, uh, there's also a claim that, um, you know, there is such thing as a great reset. Um, we've heard in some circles uh, and, you know, we have Latinos that, uh, you know, are, are intellectuals and they are looking at what's happening. There, there's a, a brother who embraced Islam at our community who drives a Tesla and works in a Fortune 500 company. And he actually does a lot of the pilot programs and technology and so on for Fortune 500 companies. So, you know, we just had a discussion the other day and he was saying, you know, and some of this technology that's being embedded into the human body, um, you know, what, what are some of those, those things that we may not even know as we're developing that technology and what sort of things can happen? And he talked about uh, the Global Econo Economic Forum talking about the Great Reset, uh, something that, that, that is mentioned regarding the pandemic being the Great Reset in the world with, um, you know, globalization and things becoming more online uh, and just the way that humanity is restructuring itself and what role does that vaccine play? So these are just some of the concerns um, that we just gather from uh, different levels at our community, Islam and Spanish. Uh, we are not only supporting, but you know, we partnered with the US Census Bureau to do the polling count uh, in conjunction with the US Census Bureau. In Houston, Texas, we're trying our best to become a vaccination site uh, as are other Islamic centers, and we're working with Engage on that as well. And so, as community leaders, we just have to be very confident, you know, that we set an example. Both of my parents have both of the vaccines already. Uh, they have no side effects. Uh, when people are getting to know each other uh, in, in regards to the fact that this is better or, you know, the, the harm, when you look at the good and the harm, especially in Islamic um, you know, when, when you're faced with an evil or a good, I mean, it's simple to understand you want the good, but sometimes we have to deal with our community almost based on, you know, the less of two evils. If there is doubt, right, there are foundations such as the Gates Foundation that's been trying to eradicate uh, polio, for example, and they, uh, since 1988 uh, to now, they say that they've eradicated 99% uh, of polio, but the only reason why it hasn't been eradicated totally is because they're not able to reach people in war-stricken areas of the world uh, to be able to get the vaccine for polio. So we, we bring forth these specific um, you know, examples 
that if there are vaccinations that are uh, ridding people of uh, passing away from diseases, um, we, we're going to be better off taking a chance, even if there are doubts and concerns and we have to rely on uh, trusted information. And so the more we disseminate trusted information, we really appreciate Amja, uh, Dr. Hatem al uh, mentioning that the vaccines uh, you know, will not break one's fast in Ramadan. This is all information we disseminate in the Spanish language. And uh, we, we really appreciate when people hear it from a trusted source, people who are from their background, their language, they begin to, you know, really, um, I, don't want, I don't want to even say give it a try, but really get with the program. And, um, you know, we just hope for the best and we can only do um, whatever we can based on the information given. And I'll end with this uh, from an Islamic standpoint in regards to Islamic law. Um, you know, before it was known that tobacco um, caused um, cancer, you know, at best it was makru, it was something disliked based on its smell and, you know, other, other issues, but it wasn't necessarily uh, to the level of it being prohibited. But once it's something that can take away someone's life, uh, the preservation of life is one of the aims or from, from the maqasad of sharia from the aims or objectives of Islamic laws to preserve human life. So as soon as uh, it's known that cancer um, can come about from someone smoking, then it became the ruling that it is uh, prohibited. So we hope to be able to develop new Muslims based on not only the emotional uh, feeling about things, but really using the tools that Islam gives us in the information that is available uh, from mainstream uh, authentic sources when it comes to health professionals and uh, and people of knowledge uh, that, that we trust. So really appreciate this time to share that information. Thank you, Jaime. That was, that was a great close. Um, from my side, I, I guess the beauty of being a moderator is I get to ask you questions from people, but I also have the pleasure of asking my question first. Uh, well, uh, I choose. Um, but uh, something that you ended on was trust. And I think that plays a huge thing uh, for the vaccination as well as the community as a whole. And something that I've realized is that there's a different level of trust and respect that providers have, but there's also community leaders and stakeholders that have a whole different level of trust. And I think if anything, a group like this coming together really helps connect the public health message that providers and scientists and everyone have to pass it on to a package that folks can pass it on to other people who have that connection with people. When the question came up, so that the reason I bring that the question came up is, how do we close the gap, uh, not only in Latino Muslim communities, but all Muslim communities? And I just, that was my take on the building trust and building bridges between different stakeholders and leaders, but I would love to hear from the panelists as well. I'm happy to, to get started on, on that. So I think for me, and this is one of the things that I'm working on as part of a work group that I lead with uh, communication and outreach on COVID-19 vaccines is empowerment through education and, and information. There's a lot of bad information out there. There's a lot of junk science, as we call it, a lot of different myths that are very prevalent. And I think it's important to, A, get information um, from you know trusted sources and, and to be able to understand that information. It's one thing that you're presented with this factual information. And as I mentioned earlier, people are looking at the top line numbers of some of these vaccines and they're confused. You hear it in the media and you're confused. What does it mean? But it's, it's and so it's, it, you need to distill it down to a, a way that people understand. And this is where good science communication comes into play. So we're not talking about you know, apples and oranges when we just want everybody to have some fruit, right? When it comes to vaccines now. And it's just making sure that we're providing that information in a way that people understand through trusted sources and empowering them to make the decisions that work best for themselves. Yeah, no, another thing we are doing, <clears throat> I know here I'm a, I'm a member of several uh, faith and interfaith uh, COVID councils uh, nationally and then also locally. And of course we're finding that, you know, obviously religious leaders uh, they, they possess a significant portion of, of the population. And of course, if they're coming forth and, and, and setting an example, uh, that's been making a difference. Uh, I know even myself here in DC, we were ready to do a public event nationally with um, 
uh, Dr. Fauci and others from the White House and, and had various various uh, religious leaders. And it made, it made a big difference. It made a big difference uh, in many that were hesitant uh, to see uh, that we were willing not to just talk about it like we're speaking now, but to actually be the proponent and actually sit there and, 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 and do it in public and let them see that we trust and we feel comfortable uh, with the virus. And uh, so we, we encourage more of that uh, to take place in various communities if they don't have groups of faith leaders coming together, uh, not just Muslims, Imams, and other ones, talking about just faith leaders, period, coming together uh, in the communities and being seen together. That, that helps uh, generate uh, the trust. And also the information comes out as well, which is what's so vital, uh, so vitally needed. Thank you. Um, just an extending from that, there was there were a couple of questions that were more on the science side of the vaccines itself. One of the questions were safety, specifically in groups, um, patients who have lupus or other inflammatory conditions, especially during uh, times of pregnancy in different trimesters and people in allergies. Um, are there specific restrictions or tips um, in taking the vaccines in, the, in these high, probably special risk populations? I'm happy to address some of those and if others on the call would like to, to take it um, as well. So first, you know, the, the, the vaccines that are currently available, if you look at um, some of the safety monitoring databases and you look at the millions of people that have been getting vaccinated and you look at, for example, just the, the risk of having um, a severe adverse reaction or an anaphylactic reaction, that's, you know, two to five cases per 1 million doses administered. So that's really, really small, especially to compare that to other vaccines that we have besides COVID-19. So I think looking at it from that lens, these are highly safe and effective vaccines, even if pe even in people that actually have uh, a history of allergic reactions. And so with that, I would encourage people to seek uh, their healthcare provider, talk to their healthcare provider, talk to their allergist to see if you have questions, if you think if, it, you know, if the COVID-19 vaccine is right for you, if you're looking at the ingredient list of the uh, COVID-19 vaccines and you have questions on it, certainly speak to your provider. That would be the best way for you to make a, a good decision on uh, your calculus of, of to get vaccinated or not. But as I mentioned, there's been um, many, many thousands of people that have a history of allergic reactions that have been able to get the vaccine safely uh, and effectively. In terms of pregnancy, you know, we have public health organizations like FDA, CDC. Uh, you also have other organizations like ACOG. Um, that have all come out and have mentioned that the COVID-19 vaccines are safe uh, for females that are pregnant, regardless of what trimester that you are in. Certainly, it's a personal decision. And when we look at the data and the science first, I think um, if you're looking at just purely in the clinical trials, right, um, pregnant females were excluded, but that's not to say they didn't get pregnant. So even in the clinical trials, there were, um, you know, a handful of females uh, that did get pregnant and there were no adverse um, side effects reported. And even um, in addition to that, before some of these clinical trials started, they do these DART studies that look at the developmental and toxicity studies um, in animal models that, again, didn't show um, any safety concerns. And then on top of that, looking at real world data, because now we have real world data. So while we keep talking about clinical trials and things like that, we can go to real world data where millions of people are getting vaccinated every day. We have, as I mentioned, um, safety monitoring systems. So if you look at Be Safe, where right now we have over 60,000 fem pregnant females that have been that have been vaccinated from COVID-19, and no safety concerns have uh, come up. So certainly, on another note, if there are questions or concerns, certainly speak to your healthcare provider. Um, and, and if the others on the panelists would like to add anything to that, certainly. Um, if if I could just add, um, when it comes to medical care, um, something I didn't mention was the undocumented, um, you know, people in this country. Some, sometimes people may not even want to access the healthcare system or any sort of system that seems to be an aid for them because they're out of status. And that is a huge concern because in the city of Houston, for example, we look at the population being 44% Latino. And the city of Houston, Texas right now just became the third largest city in America. Uh, and is the most diverse according to statistics. But Latinos are 44%. That, those are the documented. When you add the undocumented, it, it's possibly going to be over half of the population of Houston. So when you have a significant number of people who 
may want the vaccine and they want the benefits, even if they believe that it's in their best interest, but they don't think that they're part of a system uh, simply because they may ask them for their name. Um, they may fear that they don't have a social security and in any way they may lose you know, the ability to be here with their grandchildren, for example, right? So that, that's, that's a concern that sometimes um, goes unnoticed because it's not really too many polls uh, to show that sort of thing. So that's where community organizations uh, can do a great job. Um, I know we have potlucks, uh, something called Convivencia at our center, which is uh, coexistence, it's called coexistence. There are people of different backgrounds, Muslim and non-Muslim that come to share a meal and whenever people come and eat together, they get to know each other. So I, I per, we'll know people from our community who know people eventually that are in a really tight situation and they will go on to trust us because we shared a meal, but they just don't know what to do in their situation. So we have to reach out to partners that are specialists in these different areas that will be able to cater to the right answers and the right sort of uh, channeling of, of people in unique circumstances and um, at a local level, we, we've tried our best. And also from the up-down approach, uh, you know, we're a faith partner organization along with the White House. Uh, so whenever they know that we're getting the resources that the White House is providing regarding the pandemic uh, and being on panels such as this, and you know, many of you are also uh, on, on a coalition in, in regards to engaging with communication with the White House, then they begin to feel that, you know what, I know people that are part of the system and they're looking out for my best interest. And then the trust factor just goes on to become tangible little steps to get people vaccinated so that the city of Houston or any other city can you know, be better off. I think I was muted, yes. Thank you for that. Uh, we have three minutes uh, to the end of the session. Um, there's one more question that came up um, that I'll lump together. Um, it was basically surrounding the vaccine long-term efficacy and the possibilities of vaccine passport. Um, uh, there haven't been, at least, at least from my studies, there haven't been um, long-term implications just yet. Uh, but Dr. Madad, did you have any updates on the potential long-term e efficacy or the possibility of the vaccine passport? Long-term efficacy of, okay. Um, so I, I guess the question is looking at the impact of the vaccine passports. So these yeah, are the, platforms. Uh, yeah, so basically the question was yes. previously uh, in, in other coronavirus uh, situations, it hasn't been successful. So what do we hope to expect from this, this genre of vaccines? And if that happens, where does the idea of vaccine passports come in in the future? So I, I think the question is a little bit confusing. So, um, uh, vaccine passports, if you're talking about vaccine passports, then you're, I think that there's two separate questions. One's, I think, asking about the immune enhancement of vaccines, um, and then another is asking about the passport. So I, I can definitely, uh, maybe we'll take the latter question since we have about a minute. So vaccine passports is something that is certainly being highly discussed and, and debated right now, both from a local, state, national, and even international standpoint. And what this is, is basically telling you, it's a digitalized version of your health information, telling you whether you've gotten fully vaccinated or whether you've tested negative for COVID-19, and then it allows you to engage in certain activities. Like if you're going to you know, a, a large gathering like a concert and they wanna make sure, are you vaccinated or have you tested negative? So these, there are ethical, um, considerations. There's big challenges right now in terms of data privacy. These are all being discussed at all the different levels. Um, but I think that we have a misunderstanding of what vaccine passports also mean. I think that um, uh, I think um, one of the ways to look at it is that uh, it tells you, you basically have two lanes, right? You have fast track lane and you have a lane that people uh, have not gotten vaccinated and they haven't gotten tested. So that tells you that this person needs to be tested before they enter this venue to see if they have COVID-19. And the fast track is just saying that this person has, uh, has is uh, fully vaccinated or has tested negative and then you're allowed to basically into the venue. So those are kind of the, the discussions that are happening, but so, you know, certainly this is something that is a kind of a hot topic that everyone is discussing right now. Thank you. And as we close out, the question of the day, is it permissible to have vaccine while fasting? I think we all agree it is. Uh, I'll raise my hand. Can everyone raise their hand in the panel if they agree? <laughs> awesome. Thank you again so much for all the panelists. It's fantastic having you on board. I, I learned tons just being on here. And um, 
I should come on these panels more often. Um, but again, as a closing remark, this this will be this is recorded. It will be available on the American Muslim Health Professional website. Uh, both the AMP and the Mana website have tons of resources linked to this. Uh, thank you for all the speakers. The uh, <laughs> Imam Shahid, if you could um, leave us hit a small dua, that'd be great as we close out. I think I'm mute. Uh, I'm sure. Thank you. Thank you. Rabbina, Atina, Fidunya Hasna, Wafil Akhirati Hasna, Wakina, and Abin Nar. Our Lord, give us a good in this life and a good in the next, and save us from the fires of sin. Amen. <laughs>